In Vulkan, we are not able to execute commands directly with function calls. We are first required to record them to a command buffer and then submit the buffer to a device queue to be executed. While this may seem a bit tedious, it has significant advantages over older graphics APIs. Command buffers allow a sequence of commands to be recorded once and then reused for multiple frames. This is opposed to APIs like OpenGL, where draw commands would need to be repeated every frame. For now, we're going to record the command buffers once at program initialization, and then reuse them for each frame. Another option would be to re-record a command buffer every frame, which I cover a few videos from now. Command buffers have a life cycle described by this state diagram. When a command buffer is submitted to the device queue, it enters the pending state. It is invalid to resubmit a command buffer that is already in the pending state. It needs to first complete before being resubmitted. The swap chain class provided limits us to submitting at most two command buffers to the device's graphics queue at once. After two command buffers have been submitted, the CPU will block on the next call to the acquire next image function. When the GPU has finished executing one of the command buffers, it will signal the CPU to carry on. Therefore, it is possible to get away with using only two command buffers, even when there are more than two frame buffers. But when recording a start render pass command, we must specify the target output frame buffer. So in the case we have two commands but three frame buffers, we need to re-record a command buffer every frame. So at least for now, it is simpler to use a one-to-one -one relationship. Next, let's implement our create command buffers function. So let's start by resizing our command buffers vector to be the same size as the swap chain image count. The swap chain image count will likely be either two or three, depending on if your device supports double or triple buffering, as each command buffer is going to draw to a different frame buffer. Next, we need to allocate our command buffers. Create a local variable with type vk command buffer allocate info, called alloc info. Make sure not to forget to zero initialize the struct with trailing braces. Now, just like with the other Vulkan structs, set the S type member equal to VK structure type command buffer allocate info. Then the level to VK command buffer primary. There are two types of command buffers, primary and secondary. Primary command buffers can be submitted to a queue for execution, but cannot be called by other command buffers, while secondary command buffers cannot be submitted, but can be called by other command buffers. We will cover secondary command buffers in a future video. Next, set the command pool member to equal device.getCommandPool. In the device class, we have already created a command pool when our device was first initialized. Command pools are opaque objects that command buffer memory is allocated from. An application may need to create and destroy command buffers frequently, so to reduce the cost of resource creation, Vulkan has us allocate and free command buffers from command pools. This way, the most expensive step of acquiring memory can be done once and then reused as buffers are created and destroyed. Finally, set the command buffer count variable to the size of our command buffers vector. This expects a uint32 type, so static cast uint32 command buffers dot size. Then in an if statement, call vk allocate command buffers lve device dot device, a pointer to our alloc info, and then command buffers dot data. Check that this is not equal to vk success, otherwise throw a new runtime error. Fail to allocate command buffers. The next step is we need to record our draw commands to each buffer. So in a for loop, int i equals zero, i is less than command buffers dot size, i plus plus. And now we have another struct type, vk command buffer begin info, called begin info with brace initialization. Set the s type member to vk structure type, command buffer begin info. We don't need any other fields yet. Then in an if statement, call the function vk begin command buffer with the command buffer at index i as the first argument and a pointer to the begin info as the second. 
Check that this is not equal to VK success, otherwise throw an error that our command buffer failed to begin recording. So the first command we're going to record is to begin a render pass. To do so, we need to configure another struct. So create another local variable, this time with type VK render pass begin info, called render pass info. Set the S type member to VK structure type render pass begin info. Next, we need to set the render pass member, which we have already one set up for us by the swap chain. So render pass is equal to swap chain dot get render pass. Next, we need to say which frame buffer this render pass is writing. So render pass info dot frame buffer is equal to swap chain dot get frame buffer at index i. Now we need to set up the render area. This defines the area where the shader loads and stores will take place. So set render pass info dot render area dot offset equal to zero zero. Then render pass info dot render area dot extent equal to swap chain dot get swap chain extent. Make sure to use the swap chain extent here and not the window extent. Because as mentioned before, for high density displays, the swap chain extent may actually be larger than our windows. Next, we need to set the clear values. This corresponds to what we want the initial values of our frame buffer attachments to be cleared to. So first at the top of the file, include array. Then std array vk clear value with size two closing bracket called clear values. Then at clear value index zero dot color, set this equal to an RGBA value of your choosing. Then at clear values index one, set the depth stencil clear value to one zero. Remember that for the depth buffer, the farthest away value is one and the closest is zero. Don't worry about the stencil for now. So one thing that you may find confusing is why we are saying the clear value zero dot color but not clear value zero dot depth stencil. And that's just because if you remember in our render pass, we structured our attachments so that index zero is the color attachment and index one is the depth attachment. Now let's provide our render pass info with our clear values info. So render pass info dot clear value count equals static cast uint 32 type clear values dot size and render pass info dot p clear values equals clear values dot data. That's it for our render pass info. So let's record to our command buffer to begin this render pass. We do this with the function vk command begin render pass. This first argument is the command buffer we are recording to. So command buffers at index i. Next pass in our render pass info using a pointer. And for the third argument use vk subpass contents inline. The VK subpass contents argument signals that the subsequent render pass commands will be directly embedded in the primary command buffer itself, and that no secondary command buffers will be used. The alternative is to use VK subpass contents secondary command buffers, signaling that render pass commands will be executed from secondary command buffers. This means there is no mixing allowed. We cannot have a render pass that uses both inline commands and secondary command buffers at the same time. The first thing we need to do in our render pass is bind a pipeline. Jump to your pipeline header and add a public function void bind vk command buffer command buffer. Copy the function signature and paste it into your pipeline implementation file. Add the class scope before the function name and in this function call vk command bind pipeline. With the first command being the command buffer then vk pipeline bind point graphics and finally graphics pipeline the vk pipeline bind point graphics option signals that this is a graphics pipeline the other types of pipelines are compute pipelines and ray tracing pipelines we don't need any checks validating the graphics pipeline before binding because it must have been properly created at initialization back in first app call this function on our pipeline so LVE arrow bind command buffer at index i. Then use VK command draw with command buffer at index i, then 3, 1, 0, 0. This records a draw command to draw three vertices and only one instance. Instances can be used when you want to draw multiple copies of the same vertex data. 
You sometimes see this being used for rendering particle systems. We'll cover this in the future. And then 0, 0 because we aren't using any offsets into our data. We actually aren't even providing any data right now. Because if you remember way back when we set up our vertex shader, we actually hard-coded our vertices directly into the shader itself. And that's it for our commands. To finish recording, first end the render pass with vk command end render pass, command buffer at index i. And then in an if statement, vk end command buffer, command buffer at index i, not equal to vk success. In which case we throw std runtime error fail to record command buffer. So these runtime errors are mostly for debugging purposes. For a production application, we'll eventually have to handle them more robustly. So the last thing to do is finish implementing the draw frame function. First, declare a uint32 type local variable called image index. Then on the next line, auto result is equal to swap chain dot acquire next image and then pass a pointer to our image index. This function fetches the index of the frame we should render to next. It also automatically handles all the CPU and GPU synchronization surrounding double or triple buffering. The result value returned determines if this process was successful. So in an if statement, we can check that the result variable is not equal to success or that result is not equal to vk suboptimal khr. For now, we will just throw a runtime error that we failed to acquire the next swap chain image. But in the future, we will need to handle this situation because it can occur when our window is resized. Next, set result equal to swap chain dot submit command buffers. With the first argument being a pointer to command buffers at image index. and for the second argument, a pointer to the image index. So what this function does is it will submit the provided command buffer to our device graphics queue while handling CPU and GPU synchronization. The command buffer will then be executed, and then the swap chain will present the associated color attachment image view to the display at the appropriate time based on the present mode selected. Finally, let's also check that if the result is not equal to VK success, in which case we will throw a runtime error. Then scroll up and in our game loop, just below pull events, add a call to the draw frame function. So it's the moment of truth. It's time to build and run our code. If everything has been done correctly, our window should now have a red triangle. Don't panic if you get some errors or don't see a triangle. We've written a lot of code and this is the first real test. So it's almost expected that something's not quite right. Just take your time, look at any compiler errors or validation layer messages, and you should be able to figure it out. When you close your window, you will likely be bombarded by validation layer messages. This is to be expected and is because it's possible that a command buffer was being executed at the same time our application tried to close. A really easy fix for this is that in our run function, as the last line, add vk device wait idle lve device dot device. By calling this function, the CPU will block until all GPU operations have completed, at which point we can then safely clean up all resources knowing that they are no longer in use. One thing you may have noticed is that even though we never free the command buffers, we do not have any validation messages telling us they were not properly cleaned up. And this is because when our device is deleted, so is the command pool, and any buffers allocated from that pool will automatically be destroyed as well. So if you open up your fragment shader file, here we can change the color of our triangle. For example, by changing this zero to one, we should now have a yellow triangle. Build and run your code, and hmm, the triangle is still red. Well, this is actually a very common mistake. We forgot to recompile our shader code. Whenever you update a shader file, it needs to be recompiled. So you might want to set up an automatic build step to compile your shaders. How you do this will differ based on what development environment you are using. If you're unsure how to do this, a good place to start would be by Googling your IDE followed by custom build step. If you're using a makefile, I provided an updated version in the description below. What this basically does is searches for all vertex shader and fragment shader source files in my shaders directory. Note that this is a relative path. 
Then I do a pattern substitution appending the SPV file extension to each source file, and I set those as a dependency for my application. I then have an added build rule that each SPV file depends on itself without the SPV extension and can be built using GLSLC. This way, whenever the shader code is modified, a new SPV file will be generated automatically. So now if I build and run, my fragment shader will automatically be recompiled and my triangle has changed from red to yellow as expected. So now that we've drawn a triangle, it's a good time to take a bit of a step back and review the role of each component and the relationships between them. In the next video, we will remove the hard-coded data from our vertex shader and instead pass data into the graphics pipeline by using a vertex buffer. And thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Cheers.